Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, first in what will be a series on website accessibility. My name is Rebecca Christofridis. I'm the Senior Content Manager, Marketing Manager, rather, at GHD Digital. Uh, just a little bit about GHD Digital. Uh, it is the digital transformation arm of GHD, and we are dedicated to helping our public sector clients uh, digitally transform their organizations and better engage with their communities online. Uh, today we will be discussing, or rather we will be addressing the question of what is digital accessibility and why does it matter? Um, this series of webinars is a joint effort with our partner GrackleDocs, a leading provider of software and services designed to make digital content accessible to everyone, regardless of ability. With a focus on innovation and customer service, WackleDocs Inc. is dedicated to helping organizations like yours comply with accessibility standards and create an inclusive digital environment. Uh, we're fortunate today to have with us Dr. Ann Nettler of Grackle Docs to help guide us through this journey on accessibility, and Oliver Ibanez, a UX manager at GHD Digital, and Jeff Mills, co-founder of Grackle Docs, to help facilitate the chat. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Natlu. She currently serves as the Vice President of Consulting for Grackle Docs. She is an accessibility strategist with over 17 years of uh, or 17 years experience as an ADA and 504 compliance officer. Want to make sure I get this right. Director of Disability Resources Officer at both HBCUs and PWIs, corporate policy advisor, and she's a sought-after speaker, educator, and consultant. Before I turn things over to Dr. Nettler, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, there's going to be time set aside for a, a Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation, um, but you're certainly welcome to leave your questions and comments in the chat. And as I said, we have a couple of other individuals that will be engaging with you uh, in the chat. Um, and the other thing is we have included a download there for you um, that you might find useful. So with, with all that said, I will happily turn it over to Dr. Nettler. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are joining us in the world. Uh, my name is Dr. Ann Nettler. Please call me Ann. Um, and um, like was said earlier, it's my pleasure to be the Vice President for Consulting at Grackle Docs, where we are a world leader in all things digital accessibility. Uh, without further ado, I am going to start sharing my screen. Excellent. So today we're here to address um, what is digital accessibility and why does it matter? Um, and I can skip our first slide, which is about me because um, Rebecca did such a great job there. Um, today I want to address um, the definition of digital accessibility. We're going to briefly do a high level um, look at the laws, principles, and standards that are currently guiding digital access, uh, where we are currently in terms of meeting those laws, the things that are changing um, practically by the minute. Um, we'll talk about the relationship between disability, diversity, and digital access and the intersectionality that we see at play there. Um, and we'll identify some digital barriers that could prevent any individual, especially individuals with disabilities, um, from receiving access to digital or online content. Um, so some learning outcomes. Um, I would like for us all to gain a better understanding of digital accessibility and its importance, to be able to articulate the relationship between disability, diversity, and digital access, understand the current legal requirements and standards for digital accessibility, um, and identify the impact of digital access. Like any good um, faculty member, um, I always love giving those learning outcomes. I am still um, a professor teaching in two different departments at um, a university here in the US. Um, and without further ado, digital accessibility um, using the Georgetown University School of Law definition refers to the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools, and technologies by people with disabilities. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward definition. Um, it means that anything digital or electronic should be accessible, usable, available to everyone, plain and simple. Another concept I think that is closely related is the concept of universal design. And that was first um, invented by Ron Mace 
Um, and really the definition is creating an environment that is, is as accessible as possible for all people. And while universal design, the concept came about initially with individuals with disabilities in mind, um, it has branched out to all aspects of society as we know it. Um, imagine when you go to a grocery store and you're pushing a cart into the building and the door opens for you automatically. That's universal design. It's going to open for someone who's walking or rolling into the building. It's gonna open for someone who's pushing a stroller with a baby in it. It's gonna open for that delivery man who's bringing in the bread delivery for the day. Um, it's gonna open for someone who is using a walker or a cane. Um, it's gonna open for everyone because it was designed with universal access in mind. So how are we designing digital spaces with that same type of access? How are we making sure that digital resources truly are for everyone? Um, it ensures um, usability, not just access, across websites, applications, and tools. Um, we might have something that, you know, maybe from an almost scientific perspective, checks the boxes as being accessible, but is it usable? Um, is it something that is going to be robust? Is someone going to have the same experience no matter how they interact with that content? Digital access is truly integral to our modern society. Um, it is impactful in education, in communication, in employment, in entertainment, um, in any aspect of what we do, um, especially now in a um, COVID, post-COVID environment where so many things were converted to an online um, or digital medium because it had to be. But now we're living in this new reality and how are we ensuring that this reality is usable and robust and available um, for everyone, not just individuals with disabilities, but for our whole um, community and society as a whole. So in other words, universal design and digital accessibility um, is about designing all products and environments so that they are usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. And this part is really important without the need for adaptation or specialized design. Um, I think that is key. So an accessibility law and recent updates. So I'm gonna give you information about US law and Canadian law as it relates to digital access and simply access in general and the rights of people with disabilities. Um, in the United States, um, as you may know, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, however, I think it's always very poignant to point out that while the Civil Rights Act was passed in 64, it was not for another nine years that individuals with disabilities were included in that act. In other words, individuals with disabilities did not have civil rights for another nine years, not until 1973. Um, that is a concept that we often don't learn about um, in a history textbook. Um, the following after 64 and then that update to the law in 73, um, also in 1973 came the Rehabilitation Act and Section 504 um, provides that any individual with a disability um, needs to be provided equal access to good goods, programs, services, employment, education, um, all of the above. And it applies to every type of organization, public and private. There's also Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which initially um, had everything to do and still has everything to do with digital access, but only applies to United States government entities um, or institutions that receive full government funding, um, but also include there um, any sort of contractor who may be working with a government entity and providing digital information or digital materials. Now, Section 508 was recently updated to be aligned with the most recent at the time standard for the web content accessibility guidelines. And I'm gonna talk about those in just a second. And then the last and most overarching piece of federal legislation in the US that protects individuals with disabilities is the Americans with Disabilities Act as amended. And that was amended in 2008. Um, and just as a you know bit of detail, there are uh, really five titles, the fifth being miscellaneous, but four main titles, um, employment, public accommodations being Title II, that would be government entities and organizations receiving government funding, 
private accommodation, so private entities, and then the fourth being equity in communication. Now, there's a lot of changings happening in the U.S., specifically around digital access. There have already been proposed changes to rulemaking specific to Title II of the ADAAA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Those proposed changes to rulemaking were submitted for comment um, by the Department of Justice. Comments have already been provided and collected. Um, so we currently are simply waiting for those comments with whatever edits the Department of Justice sees fit to be brought into law. Um, and I do my best to stay kind of on the cutting edge of this information. And what I'm hearing um, is that that could happen as early as April of this year. Um, it is March 25th. April is only but a few days away. Um, currently, as written, um, those changes to the rulemaking align with the Web Contact Ex Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 at the level AA. Um, there are three levels to WCAG, A, AA, and AAA. A is considered um, the most basic level. AA is that standard center level, which frankly most um, laws refer to both in the US, in Canada, in the EU, um, and in about 11 other countries worldwide. Um, currently, the way that those updates are written, um, it would not impact content that's accessed through a password protected site unless there is an individual with a disability that has specific access or needs specific access to the content in that protected site, um, in, at which point um, the organization would have one day to make that content accessible. Um, it would apply to online apps, to websites, to documents that are currently used in an online setting, sent via email, videos, podcasts. Um, and once passed, um, this update to rulemaking, this update to ADA and 504 um, would be, it's written right now in such a way that once it's passed, institutions and government agencies will have between two to three years to be fully compliant, every one and zero, fully digitally accessible. Um, and the two to three years really has to do with the size of the entity. Um, and I often will, you know, speak with individuals and they'll say, well, I'm not, you know, part of a government agency um, and, and I don't work for, let's say, a higher education institution that would be considered public. Um, although if you do out there or if you are part of a government agency, uh, this very closely impacts your everyday. Um, but what I would remind individuals is, well, what if you have a contract um, with a government agency or with an institution of higher education? What if you provide products or goods or services of a digital nature um, and those are some of your consumers um, or some of your desired consumers even? This applies to everyone. And it's, um, it's taken under good advice that while this is currently affecting Title II, which is areas of public accommodation, that Title III will um, follow in fairly close succession, and that's areas of private accommodation, which is even further uh, reaching. Now, in Canada, um, there are a series of laws that protect um, individuals with disabilities. Um, the first, um, in terms of, of terms of chronology, is um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms from 1982 um, prohibits discrimination against individuals with a mental or physical impairment um, or those with relationships between those individuals. Um, there's also the, the AODA, um, which I hear um, and I speak about far more often, um, and that is the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, I think really important here when we're talking about that standard um, is that it provides uh, people and organizations, it, it extends to people and organizations. There are slightly different um, impacts depending on whether that organization employs 50 or more individuals or 49 or less individuals. Um, but pretty much if they provide goods or services, facilities, if they employ people within Ontario, if they offer accommodation, if they own or occupy a building, a structure, or something that is on a premises, um, if it plays a part in a business or other activity that the regulations may identify, then those regulations apply. 
um, and the information and communication standard within the AODA um, applies to all organizations and it implies that they must make websites and web-based apps accessible aligned with WCAG 2.0 um, and it specifically says by 2025 um, and I'm not sure if anyone has been kind of keeping their ear um, to the grindstone if you will um, with the acquisition and then also with um, the compliance um, here. But what I think is important to note is that uh, fairly recently, the government in Canada uh, made it very clear that um, while they had given themselves an extended deadline of 2025, um, they're not planning on being able um, to meet that deadline. And then the last one is the Accessible Canada Act, and that's from um, 2019. The scope in this case is government and all federally regulated agencies, um, and that aligns also with WCAG 2.0 at the AA level. So very relevant um, laws in both countries that are changing and updating. Uh, we know that the EU is also preparing to update um, its digital accessibility laws and standards because um, WCAG has been recently updated. It's anticipated that the first country to follow suit once the EU does so will be Australia um, and then many more afterwards. So this is a global need and this is a global opportunity. Um, I don't see this in any way as a burden, but instead I see this as an opportunity for all of us to ensure that we are supporting the human rights and the civil rights of our own community and everyone within our community. I just wanted to, I'm um, just, um, I'm getting some chats coming in, Rebecca, that there are still some individuals that are waiting um, in a go-to meeting waiting room. So I'm not sure if you could check on that for us. Make sure, sure that will. And thanks so much. So, what is WCAG 2.0, 2.1? Right now, the newest version of WCAG that came out um, just this past year is version 2.2. Um, in terms of similarity, 2.2 and 2.1 are pretty darn similar. There was only a few new updated standards. Um, but the basic pillars of WCAG are that content is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So what does that mean? Um, perceivable, is it available to the senses? Generally, we're talking most about vision and hearing, um, but it's not just vision and hearing. And is it available through assistive technology through the browser as it's already designed. That means what if someone uses a screen reader or a screen enlarger? Um, what if they're using a different type of reading software? Um, what if they simply perceive content differently? Um, perhaps they have a cognitive related impairment, a learning disability, an attentional disorder, um, a pain condition where um, it is it makes focus difficult. So they might be using a variety of different kinds of assistive technology. No matter how they are um, um, interacting with that information, can they perceive it? Can they identify it? Can they use all of it? Um, just like perhaps um, a person who does not identify as having a disability would be able to use all of the content. Is it operable? Does it work? Um, can someone who interacts with content differently, um, so for myself, I interact with content mostly online using my mouse, um, maybe with some keyboard commands, um, but what if that's not how another person interacts with their content? What if they don't use a mouse? Or what if they only use a keyboard? A lot of screen reading softwares, um, you may have heard of softwares like NVDA or JAWS or VoiceOver if you're using a Mac-based iOS. Um, they generally are used, um, and if you've never um, seen some of those software use, softwares used, imagine that you would shut off your monitor and only navigate your computer or websites um, with keyboard commands. And your computer reads out loud where you are within, let's say, a specific software, within a website, within different types of content, and you use key commands to navigate that content. Um, or should I say, you use key commands to attempt to navigate that content, and your success in navigating that content depends solely 
on how accessible that content is and how accessibly it was created. Um, the next pillar is being understandable. Is it clear? Um, does it limit confusion, limit ambiguity? Uh, when we're talking about digital access and the accessibility guidelines, um, we are not only referring to individuals who may have a visual impairment or who are blind or who may have a hearing impairment or who are deaf. Um, we're also working with individuals who may have a type of cognitive related impairment. Is the content organized in such a way that it would make sense? Is it consistent? Does it follow suit from one to the next? Um, is it going to limit confusion? Is it easy to find a definition? Um, is it something where when I am using it, I can use it in the same way or I access it in the same way each time? Um, is the language used clear and concise? And then lastly, um, is it robust? And by robust, we mean can a wide range of different type of technologies or assistive technologies, um, including old and new computers, old and new laptops, old and new smartphones, um, different types of assistive technology, not just necessarily um, screen readers, but also other types of reading software, other types of Zoom software, um, software that's going to provide um, assistance for those who may struggle with paying attention to content as opposed to seeing the content. Um, and that's only a very small list. Can all of those different types of technologies access the content? In other words, is the content created robustly so that it is available for all those different types of user agents. Those are the four basic principles of WCAG and all of the standards or the guidelines within WCAG align back to one of those four basic principles. So digital accessibility, it matters. And there are so many reasons why. Um, I really like this, um, this image or this cartoon and i'll describe it for you um, it's titled equality versus equity and there are three very similar um, cartoon images um, the first image is three um, what i will assume to be um, young males um, and they are looking over a wooden fence to try to watch a baseball game being played on the other side of the fence um, in the first picture each of the young males are standing on a box of the same size. Now, one of the males is taller, one is about a medium height, and one is um, shorter than the rest. So the one that is standing, that is taller standing on a box can see over this wooden fence. The one is me that is medium height standing on this box can see over the fence. Um, but the one that is slightly shorter than their peers standing on the box still cannot see over the fence. Now, this is an example of people being treated equally. Everybody has a box. The box is the same size. Everybody got the same thing. But does everybody have access? Can everyone see? No. In the second image, those three boys are there as still trying to look over that wooden fence at that baseball game. Um, but now they're given different supports. So the young man that's the tallest does not have a box and he can still see over the fence. The middle-heighted young man has one box and sees over the fence. And the shorter of the three has two boxes and now he can see over the fence. This is an example of being treated equitably. Um, everybody has what they need. They have an accommodative or an assistive measure that will allow them to have equal access. But now the third image is my favorite. In the third image, all three young men, men are standing on the grass, on the ground. Um, and instead of a wooden fence, that wooden fence has been taken away and has been replaced by a mesh fence, meaning all three of them can see the game without any sort of accommodative or assistive measures because the actual uh, barrier the systemic barrier that's been that's been keeping individuals from having actual true access was removed. We took away the fence. We put something there that serves the same purpose, but now everyone can access. This is digital access. 
How do we remove systemic barriers that have caused issues with access over time that have always been there because we've always done things the same way? How do we do that in such a way so that everyone can access in the way they need to without any sort of accommodative or special assistive measure? Digital access is a cornerstone of an inclusive digital age. It ensures that all voices are heard. It builds a stronger, diverse online community. It upholds human rights, civil rights, and equal opportunities. Um, it broadens participation. Um, it ensures legal compliance and social inclusion. Um, I'm someone that, that believes that um, ensuring that digital accessibility is present is simply the right thing to do. Um, it is a social justice opportunity. It's an opportunity to fundamentally support the human rights of an entire population of people. Um, those individuals could be our clients. They could be customers. They could be fellow employees. They could be colleagues. They could be loved ones. Um, they could be anyone. And frankly, they are anyone. Um, digital accessibility is not hard. Um, and I think that's the biggest um, mountain, if you will, that we need to traverse. And that's the first um, assumption that I always try to dispel. Digital accessibility is not hard. It simply takes um, preparation, and it takes forward knowledge so that when we create something, we put in those very easy steps so that instead of having to go back and fix it, we just simply do it the right way the first time. In my opinion, it's easier to create something accessibly than it is to create something inaccessibly. And when we think about accessibility, obviously it's more um, than ramps and elevators. Ramps and elevators are essential um, and incredibly important. But what in this age of digital content might place a barrier in front of someone? Um, things like videos without captions. Um, if you're looking at like WCAG standard, um, in order for captions to be considered accurate, they need to be at least 99% accurate, which means they've been edited for punctuation. Um, they have been edited for you know, spelling, grammar, and they indicate who is speaking um, if the speaker changes and there's more than one speaker in, an, in a video or even if it's just simply an audio podcast. Um, if you've ever played a video on YouTube, for example, um, and you click on the CC button that generally appears in the bottom right hand corner of the video screen, um, if a message comes up and it says captions are auto generated, those captions do not meet accessibility guidelines. Um, they're a great start. And if you were to take that caption file and edit it and make it at least with a 99% accuracy, then you're great. Um, but sometimes we make an assumption, um, and this is just one example, that if we publish a video through YouTube, because it will auto caption, that we've made it accessible. Um, and in that case, we simply just don't know what we don't know. Um, but those kinds of you know, auto captioning features, while they are fantastic, none of them will get you within that place of at least 99% accuracy. Um, it's also things when we are using images, graphs, charts, um, whether we're putting them on a website or in an app or in a document, sending it via email, in a software program, we need to make sure that there is a description, a brief description of whatever that image charter graph is. Um, and that's called alt or alternative text. That's a text that's actually embedded um, behind the image, if you will, digitally. Um, so a sighted user does not see the alt text associated with an image. And that text, it's not just a basic description of the image. Um, it's the purpose of the image. 
Um, so if we were to have content and let's say um, someone is struggling to get it to download correctly, or maybe I'm a screen reader user and I come to an image and there's no descriptive text, my assistive technology is just gonna say image or blank. And then I'm left wondering, does that image matter? What's in there? Am I missing some sort of very important content because there's no description? Um, and again, I always come back to the phrase, you don't know what you don't know. And knowledge is so important. I'm so encouraged that we have so many people joining us on this webinar today um, because this is the first step, right? I know this is a three-part series, um, but this is a first step for all of you. Um, in your digital access journey. Some of you may already be further along than others, uh, but the point is you're starting. Um, if the content is visual only or audio only, um, so imagine a video that has no sound. Um, what if um, I have a visual impairment or I cannot see? Um, I need a description of what is happening in that video because there's no sound, there's no description, there's no way for me to take, even based on context clues, what's happening. If it's audio only, what if I'm someone who is hard of hearing or who is deaf? I need to make sure that there is a transcript of that audio so that I can read what others are hearing. Um, Hyperlinks, sometimes we don't think about these. Um, if you've ever seen in a document or on a website or in an email, a link that just simply says, click here. Uh, that would not be considered accessible um, because if I'm not sure where that link is going to take me, I am probably not going to click on it. The same thing with if we were to hi like highlight, copy and paste an entire long URL into a document. If I'm using a reading software of some kind, my software is going to start at the beginning of that link and it's going to read every letter or you know mush of what it thinks might be words all together. And I'm not going to know what that is. It's not going to make much sense. Um, and I'm probably not going to click on the link. Um, so instead, a hyperlink should be something where the link text actually describes where that link will take you. Um, color contrast. Um, you know there's built-in free color contrast um, indicators or checkers that you can install even just as an add-in to Google. Um, that will show you whether or not you meet the standards for color contrast. Content organization. We talked about some of that when I talked about what's in WCAG um, and all of that information. Is it robust? Does it make sense? Is it organized? So whose shoes are you wearing? Um, it can be hard to put yourself in the position of someone with a disability if you don't identify that way. Um, it's important to remember that if a document looks clear to a sighted person, it may or may not be usable to someone with a visual impairment. Um, a document that I might be able to click through with my mouse or a website that I can click through or an app on my phone that I can simply scroll with my fingers and click on, um, that might not be accessible to someone who only use a key, uses a keyboard or perhaps a sip and puff machine um, or someone who uses the assistive or the accessible features turned on on their phone. Um, a document that might look logical and readable to one person um, may not be to someone who perhaps has a learning or an attentional disorder. What about some barriers that could exist for individuals with and without disabilities? Um, when you're relying on, let's say, downloaded content um, because the internet that you have access to is inconsistent, um, sometimes downloaded content, if it has not been created accessibly, when you download it and look at it, um, it seems garbled. Um, things are moved around, things are in different places. If that content was made accessibly, it will load the right way every time. Um, what if someone has a slower bandwidth? Um, if you've ever tried to load something perhaps on your phone where you don't have a great connection and maybe the images don't load. Well, imagine that that person that needs to load those images is working on a project um, or there's someone who could be a consumer um, and they want to be able to see the description of something that they're interested in purchasing. What if they're a student um, and they need to do their homework, um, but they have that slower internet connection or perhaps no internet connection at all. Um, let's say there's an image. If the image won't load because of the slower bandwidth, but was created accessibly with that alt or descriptive text we talked about, that descriptive text will load. 
whether I have a disability or not, I then still have access to the purpose of the image. I can still decide on a purchase. I can still work on my project. I can still do my homework. Um, and those are only a few examples. Um, what if someone has older or outdated technology? Um, sometimes you might try to be using, let's say an older laptop or an older phone. And whether I have a disability or not, the content might not be robust. There's one of those pillars of WCAG for you, um, for it to um, fully load on my device because my device is older. Are we creating something that's going to be as applicable as possible? Um, what if my only smart device is my phone? Um, will my content load on my phone so that I can use it in the same way it would have loaded if I had access to a computer? What if I'm simply less tech savvy? Um, Individuals from all of all different ages and walks of life have differing uh, tech abilities. Um, I have been put to shame by individuals who are uh, significantly older than I am in terms of their tech knowledge. Um, and I've also worked with individuals younger than I am who, um, who don't have the knowledge that, that we might assume that they would have. Um, and it's about not making assumptions. Um, what if someone has background distractions or competition for attention, um, whether that's an attentional disorder or whether it's a single parent who's um, doing their best to, let's say, um, try to get the family shopping done or trying to work with an organization that they need assistance from, um, or maybe they're going back to school and they can do those things at two o'clock in the morning, but they need to watch these videos to do it and the baby's asleep. So the only way they can watch the videos is if they can turn the captions on. And what if there aren't captions? Or what if those captions aren't accurate? Um, what if a person's first language is not English and they're working with content that we have? Um, is it feasible um, that they can interact with it in a way that their software, which perhaps does an automatic translation for them, will be able to use it? Um, so what might users with learning disabilities see? And I always say may because um, I could have 10 people in front of me that on, the, on a piece of paper have the exact same diagnosis and everyone will experience that slightly differently because everyone's brains work differently. Um, so this first example is called Rivers. Um, and on the screen, there is a, a, a laptop. And on the screen of that laptop, there are um, a bunch, there's a bunch of text and what this is an example of what someone with a particular kind of learning disability might see in their mind's eye when they were to look at a screen of text. In their mind's eye, um, they see the text kind of squished together so that white rivers, if you will, are streaming down the text. Um, it can be incredibly difficult for someone to get a context out of what they're reading if this is what they see in their mind's eye. Um, now this really is text. If you were to read across it, it does make sense. Um, but unfortunately, um, if this is not created accessibly, then that person who might need to use reading software um, isn't able to do so. And then they have a barrier because they have to read through content that in their mind's eye looks like it actually has rivers running through it and still glean the same information that someone who doesn't identify as having that learning disability would need to glean. Um, this is called swirls. Um, so there are some instances where a person may have a learning disability and what they in their mind's eye see clearly is what is at the very center of their gauge so or their gaze. So in this case, we see the word um, perpetual, the number 23, um, fairly clearly. However, um, this is standard text um, that for someone who doesn't identify as having this type of disability um, would look um, similar to any other, let's say, Word document or um, website content. And then the last one that I'll show you is called coding. Um, and this um, is where someone's mind's eye might replace or reverse words and letters. So they might replace letters with numbers. They might reverse um, how letters or numbers are facing. Um, so in this case, this would read, this message serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. In the beginning, it was hard, but now on this line, your mind is reading it automatically without even thinking about it. Um, I've probably read this in workshops uh, 
50 times and every time I still get um, tripped up. Um, so imagine that this is what someone's mind's eye sees when they're trying to um, access essential information that's on an app or in a piece of software or on a website. Um, this is a perfect example of why someone might use assistive technology. Um, without the content being accessible, they can't use that assistive technology. Um, so how might that impact what they're able to get out of the information, how they can use it, or frankly, whether they would use it at all? Um, so digital accessibility, it's a marathon and it's not a sprint. Um, it needs to be a sustainable journey. And I'm so glad that you all are joining us for this very first of three webinars as we talk about what that journey in the future can look like, how we can address it, what steps we can take um, so that we're taking our best foot forward or our best step forward um, in achieving full digital access. It is not something um, that anyone is expected to be able to implement and have completed tomorrow. That would be entirely unrealistic. Um, however, we can do it. There are resources. There are um, softwares that can help with editing. There are individuals who can help with consulting. There are organizations um, that provide guidance, that provide assistance. Um, and there are our community of colleagues as well. Um, and it needs to be a sustainable journey. I encourage you to continue to keep connected with us as we go through this webinar series. Um, if you're providing alternative text for an image, um, when you're looking at the purpose behind the image, uh, what I mean by that is that um, you may have the same image, but depending on the context in which it's being used, it could have a completely different purpose. Um, so for example, um, if you had um, a, a picture of a family um, on a beach making sandcastles, um, in one instance, um, that might be on an ad for um, a vacation rental organization, or perhaps even for a particular city. Um, and it says, and the alt text for one might be, a family plays on Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, um, because it's specific. Um, another might be in an ad for bathing suits, and it might be, um, you know, a family of four on a beach, dad is wearing um, blue Under Armour um, swim trunks above the knee, mom is wearing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's see, nowadays website design in React Angular, they are made a single page website, how, how to deal with accessibility. Nowadays website designed in React Angular. I would say that it would be handled in the same way. Um, the WCAG principles would still apply. Um, in the meantime, I think we have another one. It says, good day, we, we use YouTube to, for council meetings and appreciate the auto-generated caption. Are there AI tools that might do a better job transcribing the conversations during council that we could then post as a document under the video description? Sure. So there's lots of different AI tools um, or even just platforms that will do that. Depends on what you're using even for your council meetings initially, um, if whether it's just a straight audio recording or if you're using a platform like Zoom or WebEx or Teams, um, even something like that to meeting. Um, I can tell you that um, Zoom, WebEx, and Teams will all auto-caption um, the recorded content. The nice thing about that is that all of them will allow you access to the transcript that it has auto-captioned, um, meaning that all you need to do is go in and make really a few edits here and there um, to that transcript file, um, and then all the captions 
will be accessible, but the lion's share of the work has been done for you. And even in YouTube, um, you can access the transcript file that is created and edit it right there in YouTube, um, assuming that you own the video that's being uploaded to your channel. Um, so you can use what it does for you as a great starting place. Uh, and truly it does the lion's share of the work. Um, and then simply have to go in um, and go through, you know, the audio and we, you know, just make a few changes here and there. Um, that's usually my suggestion because no AI is perfect. Um, there are other software tools that do it. Otter AI um, is a great tool. Um, and I, I don't get any any cuts or anything from any of the, the softwares that I'm um, discussing. Um, but it's another really good tool. The AI is quite good in Otter. Um, nothing is going to be perfect, though. So everything is going to require a human touch. Um, let's see. I see a question. Um, you mentioned the 2025 deadline um, for WCAG in Canada. Actually, the 2025 deadline was for the AODA um, meeting WCAG 2.0. Um, is there information on when WCAG maybe that's supposed to be 2.2 might be expected um, in terms of when the AODA would be updating um, to meet 2.2 as opposed to 2.0. Um, I'm not sure, especially given that they've extended their own deadline for themselves to meet at the 2.2 double at the 2.0 double A level. Um, I would anticipate that they're hoping to reach that level of compliance um, before updating to 2.2 um, really they're, they're in line um, 2.0 there are a lot of differences or updates from 2.0 to, to 2.1 and 2.2 um, my anticipation and, and I, I I couldn't tell you for sure but this is just my professional opinion um, is that we probably have a little bit of time to wait before we see 2.2 um, because 2.0 was something that they were hoping to meet in 2025 and they're um, extending that um, are live streams of YouTube considered accessible if the auto-generated captions can't be relied on? No. Um, so it is feasible when you're doing a live stream on YouTube, um, just as if you're doing a live stream like here in GoToMeeting or on Zoom or WebEx, to include live captioning, which would be provided by a professional captionist or stenographer, um, where they can be added um, as a participant and then um, the captions generated so that individuals who would like to access them in real time, those accurate captions um, can be accessed. Um, anyone can turn on those auto or beta, beta version auto captions, um, but it just wouldn't be seen as meeting accessibility standard. Um, some people choose to turn them on because they simply prefer them. But if you have, uh, if you're trying to make something um, accessible on the front end and have a live stream fully accessible, um, then you'd want to provide um, human generated captions because those are the only way to get um, like fully accessible captions live. In some instances, organizations will put out a request asking that if anyone is requesting an accommodation to have captions, then they follow up. Um, and at that point, they would implement captions. That's a bit of a reactive response, although not, um, not illegal. Um, from a best practice perspective, I would say if we're if something is being offered and we want to make sure that um, you know it's available to everyone, especially if it's kind of an open source offering, it was always it's always best to offer live real real time captioning from a caption provider. Um, but again, um, there are several different options there. You could ask as an accommodation request so that you have do you know there's an active need, um, and you could certainly make it an option that people could turn it on. But turning on the the AI generated captions should not be considered um, as making that live um, webinar or live interaction accessible. Um, let's see, I saw another question come in. Oh, great, thank you um, on the GovStack and for answering that question specific to RA roles and properties, that's great. Yep, I'll read it out loud just in case. It says in single page application SPAs like Angular or Vue, accessibility is managed by ensuring standard accessibility practices are adhered to, including ensuring that dynamic content updates are, uh, are announced to assistive technologies using ARIA roles and properties and maintaining keyboard navigation consistently through JavaScript and proper focus management. Um, so that is what that internal um, response. Thanks so much, Oliver. 
and just to give a wee bit of a teaser, um, the next um, session of this three-part session is demystifying digital access, small changes that make a big impact. Um, so when I mentioned earlier that digital access is easy, it's attainable, it's something you can do, we're going to start tackling that um, in this next iteration of our webinar series. But thank you so much, GovStack. Thank you, Rebecca, um, GHD. Thank you, Grackle, um, for this uh, collaborative work that we um, have the opportunity to engage in together. And thank you all for popping in, for attending. This truly is um, an essential bit of information. And um, I'm excited to continue to collaborate with all of you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks, all.